Okay, so last week we looked at uh, decomposition and various uh, ecological aspects of these insects. Now we're going to put the two together. We're going to look at how insects uh, affect decomposition and the succession of those insects as animals decompose. So, this is the basic premise for forensic entomology. Um, Necrophagous insects, remember what necrophagous means? Those insects that are feeding on dead tissue. Necrophagous insects arrive on and in a corpse in a somewhat predictable sequence. This is called the ecological succession of insects. That somewhat predictable sequence. Now I say somewhat simply because as you'll see, this can kind of change. We won't definitely see this particular species of insect shows up exactly within one day while this other one waits two days or three days or four days. It changes sort of back and forth depending on the time of year, the temperature, the species. Some species will show up right away or delay for two or three days depending. So it's a somewhat predictable sequence. So this predictable sequence is influenced by the environment. Uh, where is that body found? What is the temperature outside, all that sort of stuff, the season, winter versus spring versus summer, and the state of the carrion. So is the carrion fresh? Is it in bloat, active decay, uh, fermentation, skeletonization, etc.? Now the organisms that arrive on a body arrive in blending waves of arthropods. Each wave is compromised of different organisms. So these blending waves are called sears. So those sears, those blending waves of organisms, are attracted to a particular state of decay. So this is one of the reasons we often try to characterize different states of decay. So I told you during the decomposition lecture that there have been many, many different uh, research projects involving trying to name or quantify the particular state of decay. When does the first stage end and the next stage begin? What is that next stage called? And we talked about a six-stage decay cycle from fresh through skeletonization, but I also said it's a rule of thumb because things are always changing. There's all, it's a continuum, right? But because of these sears, because of these waves of arthropods, we want to know as ooh, specifically as possible how uh, or when one stage of decomposition ends and when the next begins. Because if we can do that, then we can say, okay, it's this particular sear of insects that is associated with the fresh stage. This sear is associated with the bloat. This one is associated with active decay. And if we can do that, there's a lot more we could tell from entomology. So it's always an aspect of decompositional studies. Okay, now... Okay, just a quick reminder of the major stages of decay as we went over in the decomposition lecture. We Remember, we start out with the uh, fresh stage of decay. That uh, stage is characterized by uh, portions called algor mortis, which is the uh, cooling of the body after death. So if you remember, we had a particular timeline that the body would cool down to ambient temperature. Autolysis, which is the uh, decomposition of bodily tissues due, due to natural bodily enzymes. We see that in the digestive tract, most commonly uh, early. Liver mortis, the pooling of blood in bodily tissues to give that blue, blue uh, bruise-like discoloration. And then rigor mortis, the stiffening of the body after death, which lasts by rule of thumb, takes 12 hours to uh, develop lasts for 12 hours and disappears in 12 hours, so the rule of 12, 12, 12. So after fresh, we go into putrefaction or bloat, so that's characterized by gaseous buildup inside the bodily tissues, we then move into active decay where the bloat subsides, we get skin slippage, we get a lot of insect activity, at least that we can see, we get seepage of um, fluids massively from the body, go into active decay, which is everything is sort of deflated, sometimes called black decay, um, move into butyric fermentation, which is that stage that smells like cheese, remember that? Then dry decay and skeletonization. Okay, so from the moment of death, the insect fauna of the body begins to change. So let's talk about insects that are associated with the fresh body. In this case, we're going to be seeing mostly ectoparasites. This is, you know, 
seconds after a body dies. Okay, so any active parasites that are associated with the body will leave. And depending on the type, they will leave in different stages. So flying blood feeders, such as mosquitoes, will leave very, very early. As soon as a body just dies, as soon as that blood stops pumping, they're out of there. And they can leave more readily than any other ectoparasite because they can just fly away. Okay, so mosquitoes, um, biting flies, anything of that nature, will leave early. Things like fleas, ticks, and lice, those that spend most of their life cycle on a warm blooded body, they will leave as the body cools. So they will leave during algor mortis. Okay? Uh, once again, we don't have an exact timeline for how long is it going to take. Nobody's really looked at that. Now, myiasis causing flies. Um, myiasis causing flies may or may not die, depending on uh, what species they are and the type of myiasis that they produce. So, for example, bot flies. We talked about bot flies being true parasites. They they require the presence of a living body, a living, breathing animal, in order to survive. So, since bot flies are in the larval stage dependent upon living tissue, if the host dies, the bot fly dies. So, you would expect on this particular dead pig here to see if, if it had a bot fly infestation, you would see a bunch of dead larvae. We don't know exactly how quickly that happens or if there's a mechanism in place for bot flies to pupate really, really quickly and it close. Okay, but they will die if there's no living tissue. Primary myiasis producers, on the other hand, like Cochleomyia omnivorax, may just continue to feed on the dead tissue. So we have seen omnivorax on dead animals. In fact, there have been cases of omnivorax being laid on dead animals. So omnivorax that Oh, facultative myiasis producer, maybe. It's a primary myiasis producer, meaning it can actually um, cause a wound, a myiasis type wound, instead of just exploiting wounds that are already there. But it will just continue to feed on the dead animal, so that depends. Then we get an influx of necrophagous or necrophagous um, insects. So things like uh, the adult flies. Females will show up. There have been many instances in the literature, and I've seen this sort of phenomenon myself, where an animal dies and flies will be there within 15 seconds, very, very quickly after death. So you see the flies that will show up. In fact, there's some recent research uh, just over the past year or so, hopefully it'll come out in the literature really soon, where they were looking at the... Um, the development of the ovaries in the adult females that arrived at a body to see if there was a way to uh, statistically estimate how long the body had been there based on just the adult flies present. So the idea is that as an adult fly shows up, when the ones that show up very early right after death, they're just looking for a place to oviposit. So their ovaries should be ready to go. Nice, full, fully developed eggs. They're just ready to pop. Then after a little while, you'll see a new group of adults coming in because these uh, adult females are anontogenous, meaning that they do that they need a protein meal in order to produce eggs. So a likely place for a good protein meal in the wild is a dead animal. So you'll see this new influx of adult females that don't have eggs that are ready to lay. And the uh, the idea behind this research was perhaps it's those ones that are ready to lay their eggs that show up right away. They are just looking for a place to drop the eggs, those eggs before they lose them or before they die or whatever. And then after about 24 hours or so, you see new females coming in who maybe just need a protein meal. They don't necessarily want to um, compete with females that are ready to lay their eggs, uh, or maybe they just cannot uh, sense a fresh body because they, their antennae, their uh, senses just aren't attuned to that quite yet. They're not ready to lay their eggs, so they're not looking for an overposition site, so there's all these hormone interactions. So they're just looking for food, so they have to wait until the body's a little more ripe so that they can pick it up. Whatever is going on there. But they found during this research that, yes, within the first 24 hours, you get an overwhelming majority of the flies showing up in a body have a full egg development. While after 24 hours, you see mostly the uh, females don't have any eggs ready. And they haven't um, recently laid any. They're just looking for a protein meal. So that's an interesting aspect that is being explored now of utilizing the uh, adult stage of flies in order to um, 
age of particular body. How awesome is that? So we'll see these adult flies showing up. What they do is they sort of look all over the body. They walk all over the body looking for a good place in which to oviposit. So oftentimes you'll see a fly that will land, say, so we've got our body here, will land, and it'll land somewhere around the body or on oh, the anterior or posterior ends. And then they'll just sort of walk. And as it's walking, it's basically tasting the body with its feet. It's looking for a suitable oviposition site. Okay, maybe over here, maybe down here, whatever. It's so basically she takes the time looking for what she is trying to find. When she finds a good place, she lays her eggs. So during this fresh stage, you'll see the adult flies. You will also see eggs and early instars. And we most commonly see eggs at natural bodily openings and at wounds. So we see them on the nose, mouth, eyes, ears, uh, anus, and vaginal openings, and any wounds that happen to be on that body, including wounds caused by myiasis. Okay, so we see ectoparasites leaving, necrophagous insects showing up in their very early stages. All right, so in general, the animals will be characterized by the presence of adult flies and eggs. That's the fresh stage. Eggs will be found near natural bodily openings, on wounds, and sometimes in the protective folds of skin or in cloth coverings. Flies want to lay their eggs where they are protected. When I did a lot of research on flies, I found that if I wanted to induce um, egg laying in these flies, I had to give them somewhere where the females had something um, touching their their um, thoracic or their uh, ventral side and their dorsal side. That just sort of gave the females an idea of uh, protection. So I would crunch up um, paper towels or something like that and put them on whatever oviposition medium I was giving them, liver or whatever. And they would crawl into the folds of this paper towel and lay their eggs. So we see it here. This is uh, eggs laid in the skin folds in the axillary area of the pig. You also see here, this what is that, the ear? All right, so they're looking for these natural bodily openings, these skin places, places where these uh, fly, these eggs will be protected. The, those eggs will hatch into first star, in stars very, very quickly in warm environments. And we can see eggs hatching within 9 to 12 hours when it's a good temperature, so very, very fast. There won't be large maggot masses on the body during the fresh stage. You just don't see it. The insect, the maggots are the size of eggs. They're very tiny. So you don't see these huge roiling maggot masses like we, like you saw in that video last, uh, week. Okay. And the tissues will still look fresh. There won't be an overwhelming stench of decay. You won't see purging of fluids. You won't see anything like that. All right. Next stage, putrefaction. So. Putrefaction begins with the onset of bloating tissues and the expulsion of fluids from the body. Young maggots will move throughout the body. Uh, they will spread bacteria. They will secrete digestive enzymes, and they will tear tissues with their mouth hooks. As they move, they move in a mass. So they move in this big clump of maggots that will benefit from communal heat and shared digestive secretions. I noticed when I was grading your... Um, research questions assignment, one person mentioned looking at the maggot mass temperatures on the development of a particular maggot. That is a huge area that we don't know a lot about, and maggot masses will produce a lot of heat. So this maggot mass, you see it just moving from wherever those eggs were laid all the way around the body, just taking digestion and bacteria and all manner of stuff with it. So the larvae at first, when they are very, very young, when they are first instars, will feed in between muscles. Okay, So the muscles, as they start to decompose, they are producing fluids. There's interstitial fluid in there. There's all manner of stuff. So the maggots in that first instar are not strong enough to feed on the muscle fibers themselves. So they have to wait until the second or third instar to actually feed on the muscle fibers. As the maggots grow, as their secreted digestive juices begin to work, they'll be able to break down the muscle fibers themselves and feed on them. But at first, it starts out feeding between those muscle fibers. 
As the rate of dec decay increases and the smells and the body fluids and all that sort of stuff begins to build up, they will attract more blowflies to the bo body. You'll start to see flesh flies, you'll start to see beetles, and you'll start to see mites. So it's that scent, those fluids, all that bacterial decomposition will start to attract more insects. The later arriving flies and beetles may be predators on the maggots that were the initial colonizers. So these predators will feed on the maggots as well as on the decaying flesh itself. So they're necrophagous as well as predatory. They are joined by things like parasitic wasps or those parasitoids that we uh, looked at last week that will lay their eggs inside maggots and maybe inside pupa later on. All right, so here is a picture of some very early um, or some fresh decay. You can see at the top here, you've got, this is the outer layer of skin under which you see some second instar maggots. So they're underneath a sort of protective dead layer of skin. Then down here, you've got all of these maggots going into a natural bodily opening or all these flies going into this natural bodily opening. This is the anal area. Okay, they're laying their eggs, and this is a flesh fly that is coming a little bit later in order to uh, lay her eggs. All right, moving in to active decay. So by this stage, several generations of maggots are present on the body. Some have become fully grown. Some have made into third instar. So we, what we see during this stage is we see older and younger maggots all mixed together. These represent those very first eggs that were laid on the body. That first fly that showed up, she laid her eggs, those are going to be the oldest maggots on the body. Okay. Then, as the body had begun to decompose, or as other flies moved in, we get maggots of different ages. Okay. So we got the oldest, which are the first there, and then they get sort of younger from there. The maggots will begin to migrate from the body to find uh, pupation sites. So the maggots do not like, for the most part, pupating where they live or where they eat. So they'll move away and they will burrow into the soil to become pupa. Now they can move anywhere from just a few feet away from the body, from just directly underneath the body, to on smooth surfaces upwards of a hundred feet away. So indoors, over linoleum, over concrete, anywhere like that, they can go really, really far. Basically, they're just looking for a dark, protected place because they have no protection in that pupil stage. Okay? So you can see them just start to move in this stage. Now, during this active decay stage, predatory maggots are much more abundant. Um, they are there to feed on other maggots. So usually predatory species will wait a little bit until there is a good population of prey maggots on the body. So things like Chrysomer bosses in my area, they tend to wait 24 to 48 hours after the body has died in order to uh, colonize. What we think that they are waiting for is a good population of prey waiting to make sure other maggots will be there so that their maggots, these roof bosses maggots, have something to eat in addition to the uh, decomposing flesh. So the early seers or the pioneer flies cease to be attracted to the corpse at this point. So this active decay with its very strong smell, with its overwhelming number of maggots, you won't see that first seer, that first wave of insects anymore. So you won't see primary colonizers showing up and laying more eggs. You may see a few adults here just getting getting a, a protein meal or something, but you won't see any new, say, Cochleomyia macellaria eggs or Formia regina eggs or anything else, any Lucilia eggs for the most part, anything that is considered a primary colonizer. Predatory beetles will lay their eggs at this point in the corpse, and their larvae will then hatch out and feed on the flies um, and on the flesh of the uh, uh, decomposing animal, depending on their their life history and parasitic wasps are even more common here there's so many more maggot masses so many more pupa that the parasitic wasps wasps are really really attracted to this particular stage all right so this is an active state of decay close up you can see we've got a uh, green bottle fly here down at the bottom all right, we've got some egg masses here, a lot of first instars, some second instars. Look at this huge third instar going on right here. And right on top of that third instar is a parasitic wasp. 
There's also some beetles. So you have this great mix of different ages of flies, different ages of maggots, different species that have been coming in and exploiting this body and its now its new inhabitants. All right, that's it. <laughs> Let me know if you have any questions.